Welcome to this online lesson looking at some of the outcomes of the Crimean War. I've called this Someone Had Blundered. What were the outcomes of the Crimean War? You might notice that I've used a line from one of Tennyson's poems there, Charge of the Light Brigade. If you're unfamiliar with those events, it would be worth having a look at the Battle of Balaclava lesson that I've got before this one in the playlist. As a starter then, study these pictures. What changes in the army might they, these represent? If you want to have a go at that, and it might re require a little bit of educated guesswork, then pause the video now. OK, so let's see what we come up with. Well, first of all, our aims today are to know information about how the army changed after the Crimean War, to explain the reasons why the army changed, and to evaluate the extent of change. Back to the images, you might recognise the woman on the left as the Lady with the Lamp, Florence Nightingale, a remarkable person about which a lot of mythology has been written and about an awful lot of things about which are absolutely true. Um, we then got the cap badge of the Cheshire Regiment. Well, the significance of that is the reorganisation of the army into localised regiments which had different battalions for different purposes, something that we'll revisit later on. The third in, that is the Victoria Cross, the highest award for bravery in the British Army. And we're going to find out how that is linked to what happened in the Crimean War. And the last is a picture of a donkey, because donkeys are funny. Well, actually, I'll put that one in there not just because donkeys are funny, but actually because of an idea about lions led by donkeys. This is a phrase that's often used uh, in reference to the First World War. The story goes that a German commander had suggested that the British soldiers were uh, fighting like lions, and yet they were led by donkeys. This conversation almost certainly never happened. However, the idea of brave soldiers being led by useless commanders has been revisited many times. And despite the fact that it's the origins of that phrase relate to the First World War, it could easily be applied to the leadership of the British Army in the Crimean War as well. And so, let's have a look at what changed about the army in the wake of the Crimean War and the lessons learned from battles like Balaclava. Let's go! Effect number one relates to civilian effects. Here are two images that we might recognise. The top one is William Howard Russell. He was a reporter for the Times newspaper. Below that we can see uh, Florence Nightingale, a famous nurse from the time. One person who's not pictured but who is significant because he took the photograph of William Howard Russell is Roger Fenton. His work was also important at this time. Let's have a look at a summary. William Russell's reports and Roger Fenton's photography had brought the realities of war to ordinary civilians like never before. This had a profound effect on people's attitudes to war. Florence Nightingale revolutionised nursing based upon her Crimean experiences and making nursing into a respected profession. So what was the public reaction to the end of the war? Well, let's have a look. Borough of Stafford. Peace rejoicings. On Thursday the 29th of May instant, it is requested that all business may be suspended and the day kept as a general holiday in order to celebrate the ratifications of peace. The aged poor, both men and women, will be regaled in the covered market hall with roast beef, plum pudding and ale at one o'clock at noon. All poor persons of 55 years of age and upwards who wish to participate in this feast must apply for tickets on Tuesday next, the 20th instant, at the Guildhall Stafford at four o'clock in the afternoon. John Giffen, Mayor. Guildhall, 15th of May, 1856. Well, clearly in Guildford, they were, uh, sorry, in Stafford, I should say, they were celebrating the end of the war. But what can we learn from this? This is a poster put up by the borough of Stafford in 1856 as part of the peace celebrations after the Crimean War. Look down, if you want, some brief answers to this. What does this poster tell you about people's attitudes to the peace? If you want to do that, pause the video now. OK, hopefully you recognise that the, uh, the, the feast involved with the poor people would need to be paid for by the rate or taxpayers. So people were prepared to spend money and actually celebrate this properly by having a public holiday on the, uh, the 29th of May. This probably reveals to us that there was a certain amount of relief and satisfaction that the war was over. But let's have a look and see how the war finished. So the treaty that finished the war was called the Peace of Paris. And to say it was unpopular is a bit of an understatement. In short, people were not satisfied with this peace treaty. Although most of the basic disputes that caused the war were addressed, people believed that the terms were too lenient on Russia. Prime Minister Lord Par Palmerston, in, who is pictured, urged the Foreign Secretary Lord Clarendon to make the terms more punishing but to no avail. 
After all, that, that would have required agreement from the other treaty signatories, such as the French and the Turks. The British public were not satisfied and booed and hissed the heralds that announced the news. But why might the public have been so unhappy? Russia was beaten and bankrupted by the war after all. Well, the fact is the British had suffered during this war. They had seen their soldiers suffer like never before. William Howard Russell's reports of their suffering had brought that home to them like never before. And the stories of ordinary people were more visible than ever before. So the idea that Russia, having inflicted so much uh, suffering, in the minds of the British at least, should get off lightly, was never going to be that popular. However, for our purposes, the changes that are more important are those that affect the organisation and running of the army. And that's what we're going to look at next. Effect number two, changing the army. So what flaws in the army were exposed by the Crimean War? Well, you might remember that officers, for example, bought their positions of power. This was a process known as buying their commissions, and the leadership was inconsistent to say the least. Also, the power structures involved were really quite inefficient. Strictly speaking, the Queen was the head of the army, but she was hardly an experienced general. The uh, way that the army was organised in terms of supplies and keeping the men properly equipped were absolutely shambolic. And part of the problem with this was a, a gr too great a reliance on bureaucracy, which simply delayed things quite apart from the physical and practical uh, uh, aspects of trying to get the supplies out to such a, a remote and dangerous location. So one of the early actions was that Parliament decided to act and bring the army more under its control rather than the monarch and the generals. This would make the generals, such as L uh, Lord Raglan, more answerable to Parliament. Not that Raglan survived the war to, to answer such questions. He unfortunately for him, him died of dysentery before he was able to get there. This was done in two stages. Firstly, with something called the McNeil Tulloch Report. This was in 1855, so while the war was still going on. Now, this was a, an inquiry into the failings in the army as the war was still continuing. Secondly, the Cardwell Army reforms in 1870-71. to 71. These were when the changes were actually enacted. Yes, you may have noticed something here. Most of these changes were not enacted for 16 years after the McNeil Tulloch Report was um, was written. You might want to consider why this might be. We're now going to have a look at the McNeil Tulloch Report and what it recommended. The McNeil Tulloch Report was led by these two men. The report was conducted during and soon after the war and it was ordered by the government worried about the supply problems and disease. It focused on failures by civilian companies to supply the troops, the failure and negligence of the army, and the report was a scathing attack on the army, its leadership and its organisation. The army covered up the latter and no action was taken for 15 years. First of all, summarise. What was the remit of McNeil and Tulloch? What were they asked to investigate? Secondly, what were their findings? And thirdly, why was the report ordered in the first place? As an extension, give an example that backs up the report's findings. If you want to complete those tasks, press pause now. As for part four, the extension, examples that back up the report's findings might relate to the failures of leadership that led to things like the charge of the Light Brigade and the failures in organisation that led to the shortage in supplies and warm clothing for British uh, troops. We're going to revisit the medical aspects to this in a future part of the lesson. For now, though, we're going to have a look at the, let's face it, quite delayed reforms introduced by Lord Cardwell as part of Cardwell's army reforms. New subheading then, the Cardwell Army Reforms. There's a, a contemporary cartoon or caricature of Lord Cardwell. It wasn't until William Gladstone's government in 1868 that the real change came to the army. Gladstone's Secretary for War, Edward Cardwell, led the reforms, in part based upon the McNeil Tulloch Report. Its aims were to make the structure of the army more efficient and to reward good leaders and soldiers regardless of rank and background. Socially speaking, that second point was absolutely revolutionary at this time, and it's a rare example of the Victorians breaking down these deep class uh, structures, but let's not get carried away with how much they did it. We're going to have a look at these different aspects separately. Let's have a look at the structure and organisation of the army and how that changed. Gone were many of the different departments of the armed forces that had made supplying the soldiers and getting things out to them so inefficient and such a shambolic mess during the Crimean War. The new structure be summed up as follows. 
Firstly, the War Office, combining all military departments. This was split in two between the British Army, remember it's the British Army, not Royal Army, on account of its origins as the new model army and its control by Parliament, and the Royal Navy. At the moment, there was no need for an air force. Not even the, uh, the War Office were a was able to time travel and invent the aeroplane 30, 30 years early. Although it should be said that when the air force is introduced, that's not until 1918 with the creation of the Royal Air Force during World War I. Prior to that, there had been the Royal Flying Corps with the British Army and the Royal Naval Air Service. I should probably stop digressing now. Then the British Army itself was organised into local regiments. This is a crucial part of their recruitment strategy. Men could be recruited into these local regiments and serve within their local area before being sent where they were actually needed. Example of these would be the Royal West Kents, the Devonshires, etc. And these local regiments existed until reasonably recently. These regiments were split into three battalions. One battalion would be overseas on active service, guarding the empire and putting down rebellions. The service abroad was cut from 12 years to 6 years to make it a more uh, attractive prospect for recruiting, but also as uh, steam navigation and sailing became a safer and easier prospect, it was possible to rotate large numbers of soldiers more frequently than it had before. Nevertheless, being abroad for 6 years was a serious commitment for anyone. A second battalion would be at home, in Britain, training. A crucial component of a standing army is that when it's not fighting, it is training for the next war. And then the third battalion was a reserve or militia battalion, only called up in emergencies and made up of partly uh, part-time and partly trained volunteer soldiers. You might want to make a note of this structure now, and you could also include some illustrations to your notes. As an extension, you could explain how this was superior to the old system. If you want to do that, pause the video now. OK, let's move on to the treatment of the soldiers. How were they treated? Let's have a look at rewards, promotions and punishments. After Cardwell, the process of rich families buying commissions, this means their officer ranks, in the army was outlawed. The commander-in-chief was now answerable to Parliament, who would question mistakes and failures. Imagine how that would have affected Raglan if he had survived. And also the flogging or whipping of soldiers in peacetime was outlawed. This process was incredibly humiliating. In the description, I've uh, included a reenactment of a flogging, or rather a link to a video of a reenactment of a flogging from the TV series Sharp. Although this is based around the, uh, the start of the 19th century, it still gives a pretty accurate idea of the humiliating process of flogging. How did officers get their jobs in the Crimean War and before? That's task one. Secondly, explain why Cardwell's reforms got rid of this. What positive effects might it have on the army? Thirdly, why might the humiliating flogging of soldiers have been outlawed? Lastly, and as an extension, why might the option of flogging have been kept in times of war? If you want to complete these tasks, pause the video now. Done? Well, for task one, we should have identified that most officers did not get their jobs based upon merit. They'd simply paid for their, their commissions and they'd only get kicked out if they did something seriously wrong. Secondly, Cardwell's reforms got rid of that process because they needed to ensure that the army was being properly led rather than just by men who were rich. Thirdly, why might the humiliating flogging of soldiers have been outlawed? Well, really, it was recognised that soldiers often were being flogged for pretty minor offences. It was not uh, consistently applied justice across the, uh, the whole army. And they realised that humiliation of soldiers was not the best motivation for these men, especially in peacetime. However, the option of keeping flogging in, peace, in, in wartime, when it might be more urgent to correct men, if you like, um, at shorter notice and with a more severe example, was kept as an option at the commander's discretion. Let's consider what other aspects came into this. Thirdly is the Victoria Cross. There it is in the picture. It's made from the melted down uh, metal of Russian guns that were captured at the end of the Crimean War. Even today, the Victoria Cross is made from that same metal, and one day the, me the metal will run out. But hopefully there won't be too many wars for the metal to be awarded in, and so it should last for a little while yet. It's awarded for bravery in the face of the enemy. So by acting bravely in the case of an accident or shipwreck, you cannot win the Victoria Cross. It must be in action in the face of the enemy. Thirdly, it is the highest bravery award that the country can award. And lastly, and perhaps most significantly, it was available to all ranks. 
It is known that Prince Albert, the wife of Queen Victoria, was instrumental in the introduction of this weapon. But why was he so interested in the exploits of ordinary soldiers? Well, perhaps part of that credit can go to William Howard Russell, whose vivid accounts of the soldiers' actions during the Crimea War raised public sympathy for their actions and an appreciation for their bravery, and it was decided it was high time that ordinary soldiers should be rewarded for their bravery and not just their officers. Although if officers did things that were individually brave, that too was considered worthy of award, and the Victoria Cross was open to them as, long, as, uh, as well as everybody else. Let's have a closer look at the medal. A very simple and iconic design with a burgundy ribbon, laurel leaves which represent victory and achievement on the, uh, on the bar, the V for Victoria and underneath that the cross itself like a Maltese cross with a ribbon on it saying for valour which gives us an indication as to why it was awarded remembering that valour means exceptional bravery. The British lion stands proud over the crown. The only part of this design that changes is the style of crown depending on whether it's a king or a queen who's on the throne at any given time. The same jeweller's shop that has always made it in London still makes the medals to this day. There are several kept in storage just still waiting for owners but hopefully there won't be too many wars in which they need to be won. Let's have a look at the next change once you've taken any notes that you want to on the Victoria Cross. Fourthly, we're going to look at some very brief weapons developments, although not very many. Percussion caps to breech loaders. In the Crimean War, British rifles used percussion caps, but otherwise were similar to the Napoleonic muzzle loaders. Notice in the photograph on the left, we have a different style of hammer. Rather than having a flint that sets off the gunpowder, instead you've got a hammer that strikes a metal percussion cap that is placed on top, the, um, on top of the uh, priming powder pan. Uh, these worked in a very similar way to the, the toy caps that you get in guns that go bang that children play with today. On the right, however, we can see rolled brass cartridges. Yes, there is still some sealing paper on here, and although they do look a bit dented and crude, this was a dramatic improvement. These cartridges do not need to be bit, they do not need to be uh, torn open, they can simply be inserted into the back or breech of the gun. This is a much, much faster loading procedure. It's far more reliable and far less fiddly. Where's the percussion cap? Well, the percussion cap is in the base of the cartridge and so fires automatically when a firing pin hits it. The rifle being loaded there is a Martini Henry rifle, which fired an exceptionally large bullet of this design. It was a very fast firing weapon until the introduction of repeating or bolt action rifles later on. So a couple of tasks for you. Firstly, study the photograph. What are the advantages of A, brass cartridges, and B, breech loading? If you need to review this part of the presentation, just skip back a couple of minutes and listen again. Answer the questions, and when you're done, we'll move on. Okay, let's go. Fifthly, we need to consider the size of the army. The army reserves were cut from, uh, to 35,000. Let's bear in mind that other European powers at this time would, could field over 1 million soldiers. So why was the British Army's reserve cut to such a small degree? Instead, Britain pursued a policy of protecting the UK using the Royal Navy. After all, Britain is a, a, uh, an island nation. If the Navy could prevent invasions, a large army at home would be unnecessary. So some tasks for you. 1. Britain built the most powerful naval ships in the world, especially at the turn of the 20th century. What are the possible advantages of Britain focusing on the Navy for protection? Secondly, and as a challenge, what potential weaknesses are, and risks are there to this idea? Pause the video now while you answer those questions. Done? Well, one possible advantage of Britain focusing on the Navy for protection is that a reasonably small number of, uh, of ships with reasonably small crews compared to a very large army could still effectively protect the country. In an era before aerial warfare, the only way that an enemy could invade Britain was by sea. And if the Royal Navy could prevent that happening, there would be very little need for a large army at home. Let's not forget as well that around the Empire, Empire soldiers were often the ones who were doing the guarding of different places. We're talking about soldiers from India, from, uh, from South Africa, and from Australia, Canada, and other places. What potential weaknesses and risks are there with this idea? Well, should there be an invasion of Britain, then the army is going to be too small. 
or should Britain get pulled into a major continental war and have to field a large professional army, they will not have one to draw upon. Not that that could ever happen, of course, although they, they may have assumed that in the late 19th century. Of course, the events of 1914 were going to show that to be rather inaccurate. Ready to move on? Let's go. We're now going to have a look at the development of artillery at this time. This photograph is an original by Roger Fenton. Fenton was unable to take pictures of the action itself because the camera technology at the time did not allow for the capture of things that were moving. However, this shows a, a cannon redoubt similar to the ones used at Balaclava, although this one was actually overlooking Sebastopol during the siege. Notice the damage and chaos surrounding these guns, which has also been hit by Russian artillery. The siege of Sebastopol used a huge amount of heavy artillery, with both sides digging defensive trenches to protect themselves. This was warfare like World War I, only 60 years earlier and without any machine guns. As a result, heavier and heavier, more and more accurate and faster and faster firing guns were developed. We're going to do a comparison now between Napoleonic artillery and the artillery developed by the end of the Crimean War and slightly later. Study the pictures and labels first of all. Then decide what key differences are there between the guns. In what ways is the modern artillery, and I say modern in inverted commas because this is still over 100 years old now, more effective than the old? And lastly, what impact might this effectiveness have had on tactics? Note that this is the Napoleonic artillery. It's a bronze gun, which is muzzle-loaded with a smooth barrel. What that means, or smooth bore, is that it doesn't have rifling. That affects the accuracy of the projectile that it fires. It is light and it has wheels that gives good mobility so it can be moved around the battlefield quickly. But it fires small bombs or small cannonballs with a very low rate of fire. Every time it's fired the, the barrel needs to cool down, it needs to be swabbed with that thing that looks like a feather dust, duster which should actually be dipped into the bucket of water underneath to, to cool down any remaining embers of gunpowder within it. It would then need to be loaded with a charge, rammed home, the projectile included, rammed home, and then the fuse put in and then fired. All of this could take several minutes to achieve. Now let's have a look at the kind of artillery that was developed after the Crimean War. In this case, this is an example of a breech-loading ship's gun, but it gives you an idea of more general artillery trends. It has a rifled, accurate barrel that shot large shells or bombs for an exceptionally long distance accurately. It was breech-loaded for a faster rate of fire. The back of the gun could hinge open and the projectile and the charge placed in directly without having to swab the barrel out and without the crew having to put themselves in harm's way by getting around the front of it. However, it was heavy and it was hard to move. This sort of artillery was best for ships and fixed forts. It should be noted, though, that the breech-loading and rifling uh, innovations were also applied to lighter field artillery, which would look a little bit more like the gun on the left, only more, more refined. So those are your images with the labels. You might want to create your own uh, copies of these. And certainly you might want to create the uh, complete the three tasks above. If you wish to do that, pause the video now. Well, hopefully the differences between these guns should be fairly obvious. But the ways in which the modern artillery is more effective is largely based upon the weight of the shell that it fires and its range and accuracy, all of which were superior to the earlier weapon. What effect might this have on tactics? Well, consider what happened to the Light Brigade. They were facing artillery which was much more like the artillery on the left. Consider how vulnerable cavalry charges would be against more accurate and larger bombs. Also consider what effect this has on fixed fortifications. The era of fixed fortresses is now coming to an end because heavy guns like these could blast them to destruction from beyond the range of the fortresses themselves. Let's consider wider changes in tactics. This is part of the wider and longer trend that is the declining role of cavalry. Can we think of any examples of cavalry becoming less important that we've already seen in specific battles and events within battles, in technological developments and in tactical developments? Give an example of cavalry getting less important for each of these different bullet points. If you're going to attempt that, then press pause now. Oh, but one quick clue. Have a look at the picture. Did you identify the picture? Hopefully you did. That is the charge of the Light Brigade, surrounded by Russian cannon and with Russian cavalry ready to countercharge.
So, as an example of the declining role of cavalry, you might have mentioned the charge of a light brigade. But what else? Well, specific battles and events within battles include the Thin Red Line, where Russian cavalry was taken out by the rifles of the Thin Red Line, or 93rd Highlanders. Also the charge of a light brigade, as mentioned. Artillery and rifles simply beat cavalry. Technological developments as well. Bayonets, remember, allow foot soldiers to defend against cavalry even when they do get close. And lastly, tactical developments. Remember Waterloo with the infantry squares and the French failure to break through them. Time to look at another development now. And this one we're going to look in, a, in a sub, some depth. If you happen to be doing the GCSE on medicine through time, this section could be potentially very useful for you. We're now going to look at medical care. In the Crimean War, 2,755 soldiers were tragically killed in action. 2,019 died of wounds shortly after battles. 16,323 died of disease. Those are not happy figures. Soldiers might expect to go to war and die from wounds or die in battle, but would they expect to go to war and die of disease? Well, if they knew anything about the history of warfare, they probably would have recognised that through most of history, disease is more dangerous to soldiers than enemy action. But nevertheless, in a supposedly more modern age where medical developments were happening all the time, these were pretty awful statistics. In the winter of 1854-55, over one-third of the British Army stationed on the Crimean Peninsula died from disease and the cold. The army simply couldn't afford losses like this, and so they had to do something. All armies expect to have wounded and sick men, so what went wrong? Well, we must say what went wrong again. The medical services were organised in the following way. The medical services were organised by Dr Andrew Smith. That's not him in the picture, that's actually the Duke of Wellington. He was told the British Army in the Crimea would number 10,000 men. In reality, almost a quarter of a million troops were deployed in the total, if for the whole war. Worse still, the medical services that existed in the Napoleonic Wars had basically been dismantled by the Duke of Wellington. You would have thought a military man would have known better when he became Prime Minister. In addition, there were only four medical staff per 100 men, and Raglan had ordered that the two hospital ships that he did have were converted into troop transports. Also, Dr Smith basically had to start again from scratch, but it was an impossible situation. So let's see what he tried to do. Firstly, summarise the problems faced by Dr Smith in no more than 45 words, so do keep to the point. If you want to do that, pause the video now before moving on. OK, let's move on now. Consider these sources. This is the question I'd like you to answer. Read sources A and B and use the information you've gathered this lesson and in previous lessons, including in the Balaclava lesson that you may have looked at previously. Who or what was to blame for the standard of medical services offered to British troops in the Crimea? That's the question you've got to answer based on the information you can get. I've included a glossary on screen as well if you want to have a read of that. I will read both sources once and then give you the opportunity to answer. Alternatively, you might want to pause the video here and read them for yourself, comparing them to the glossary. You could even take a screenshot and print them. Source A. The mistake that has been made has been a very common one in our country. Certain military establishments have not been kept up in peacetime because people took it into their heads that war would never come. In France, there is a permanent wagon train, always organised, a permanent commissariat and also a permanent ambulance. The English people destroyed these above-named departments that existed during the Spanish War. That's the war against Napoleon. Uh, the British government on deciding upon war should have instantly begun to organise them again. That's from Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Stirling's The Story of the Highland Brigade, which was published in 1895. Stirling fought in the Crimean War and was very critical of how it, were, how it was run. Let's have a look at Source B now. Whether it was a scheme for saving money or utilising the poor old men or by utilising the poor old men or shortening the duration of their lives and pensions, it is difficult to say. But they have been found in practice rather to require nursing themselves than to be able to nurse others. At Gallipoli and in Bulgaria in the Ottoman Empire, they died in numbers, while the whole of them were so weak as to be unable to perform the most ordinary duties. The man who conceived the idea that the hard work of a military hospital could be performed by worn-out and aged cripples must have a slight knowledge of warfare or profited little by experience. That's pretty scathing stuff. 
from a report sent to the Times by Thomas Chenery, their Constantinople correspondent who published this in September of 1854, while the war was still going on. Naturally, William Russell was the one reporting from the Crimea. Uh, Constantinople, as centre of the Ottoman Empire, was a major staging base. So if you want to have a go at that skills builder task, pause the video now. So who was to blame? You may have identified the British government as having been to blame for having dismantled these, these services. Similarly, the army and high command could also be put to blame. What about those people actually in charge of running the, the, the war? Selecting old men as nurses was probably not the greatest idea. Whatever you've come up with, I hope you found that helpful. Let's move on to things uh, improving and how they improved. In particular, Florence Nightingale, an absolutely legendary figure who deserves to be remembered so well. So I wonder how many of you have heard of Florence Nightingale? Well, I can tell you now when I ask my classes, almost all the hands usually go up. Who can give an example of how she is often shown? Well, for the, in response to that question, many people often identify, oh, she's the woman with that lamp. And yes, the lady with the lamp is the mythological figure that we often associate with Florence Nightingale. But who can be specific about what she actually did to improve nursing? Well, that's going to be the focus of what we're looking at next, and we're going to get it from a series of sources. First of all, you might want to create a grid much like this. An A4 sheet of paper should be sufficient for the purpose. If you want to do so, pause the video now and get it done. So we're going to consider three sources here, source A, B and C. We're going to consider each source in terms of what it tells us about nursing, the ways that it might be reliable or trustworthy, and the ways that it is not reliable or trustworthy. We're going to have a look at source A now. Source A, an extract from a book about famous campaigners for change published in 1995. Florence Nightingale's parents hoped that she would follow the path of the most upper-class English girls and spend her time visiting friends and going to parties in the hope of meeting a wealthy husband. But Florence had other ideas. When she was 18, she became convinced that God had a purpose for her, to care for the sick. This idea horrified her parents, because in those days, nurses were usually rough women with little or no training. It should be recognised that nursing was a very lowly respected uh, profession at this time, and it was often seen as little better than prostitution. Very unfair, but it was not professional, and there was a lot of sexism around. Anyway, pause the video now and fill in the details for Source A on your table. Right, let's see what some of the basics you may have come up with. On the next screen, I'll give some suggestions, but you may well have come up with more than this. What does it tell us about nursing? Well, nursing was seen as a lowly career during the 19th century. What ways might it be reliable? The attitudes in the source were common in the 19th century, so we can probably trust that these are true. What ways is it not reliable? It was written as part of a book about campaigners, so it might be biased in favour of characters like Florence Nightingale. You may have added other details. Nevertheless, we're going to move on to source B now. Source B, an extract from a letter to a London surgeon by Florence Nightingale in November 1854. So this is a primary source from the time. Let no lady come here, a military hospital, who is not used to exhaustion and shortages. Even the nuns working here are complaining about conditions. Sometimes the roof is off our quarters or the windows are blown in and we are flooded underwater all night. The poor fellows who are brought here have not had a clean shirt, nor have been washed for months. But we have not a basin, nor a towel, nor a bar of soap, nor a broom. Fill in your table now, and you can pause the video. OK, let's have a look at some examples. War hospitals were dirty and patients were unwashed. The buildings were damaged and nurses needed to encourage clean and cleanliness. Those are all details that we may have got or inferred from the source. What about its reliability? Well, it is a letter written by, by Florence Nightingale, who had first-hand experience of these hospitals, in particular the military hospital at Scutari. However, Nightingale may have exaggerated to gain the sympathy of the surgeon who might have been able to offer her support from London. 
Finally, we're going to have a look at source C. But first, you might want to take a note and a moment to make some improvements to your own uh, table and its details. Right, let's move on. Source C, a set of rules issued by Florence Nightingale in 1859 when she had established a nurse training scheme at St Thomas's Hospital in London. All Nightingale nurses must be subject to proper regulations about uniform, hours of attendance upon the sick, hours of, uh, of attendance at lecturers, etc., as set out by Miss Nightingale. The matron shall be responsible for making sure the rules are strictly obeyed. Each nurse shall keep a daily ward book in which, she will, in which shall be recorded her duties. These must be forwarded monthly to Miss Nightingale for inspection. The present matron shall provide a list of unsuitable nurses to be dismissed to make way for the Nightingale nurses to start their training. I have to say Florence Nightingale sounds like a pretty tough uh, boss here, but that's exactly what nursing needed at a time when it was not respected as a profession. So, let's make some inferences about this now and fill in your table. Pause the video now. Okay. These are the things you might have come up with. Nightingale introduced rules for nurses and nurses were regularly checked. How might it be reliable? These are the rules set by Florence Nightingale so you could actually check them and Florence Nightingale is known for improving nursing. What might not be reliable? Well, although it's one thing to have the rules down there, but we would need to check other sources to see if those rules had been followed. Although I can tell you that the rules were followed, otherwise Florence Nightingale would have had something to say about it. She also wrote a book. It was called Notes on Nursing, What It Is and What It Is Not, which still provides some useful information for nurses to this day. My mum learnt to be a nurse in the 1970s, and she had a copy of that book at that time as well, and some of the advice genuinely is good. Let's do one more bit of source work before we move on to the last activity. Here's source B again. And here's a picture of Scutari Hospital after Nightingale had made her improvements. It's a big contrast, isn't it? Well, here's what I'd like you to do. Describe the improvements made compared to source A. Be as specific as possible. As an extension, explain how at least one change would have actually helped the patients at the hospital. Pause the video now and give yourself a moment to do that. Done? Well, here's some brief observations. Notice that the roof of the hospital is still very much there. And yet Nightingale describes a very tumble down building in her original description. Everywhere is spotlessly clean. Everywhere is swept up properly. Looks like they've managed to get that broom and the bar of soap that they were looking for. Notice as well how well cared for the men are with individual nurses helping them. With a warm fireplace with its fumes put safely out of the window. And how well lit the room is as well. These are all things that Nightingale considered incredibly important in the care of her patients. It should be noted that in the 1850s, people were yet to be aware of the danger of germs, but a link between dirt and disease was very clearly known. And so, by keeping this room clear and with fresh air coming through all the time, it was considered a healthy environment. Just look how those windows are open to allow a breeze to healthily pass through the room. OK, we're going to look at one last aspect. Let's not forget Mrs Seacole. Controversially, Mrs. Seacole has at times been left out of the historical record, and yet it's easy to actually exaggerate her role by, uh, by feeling outraged by this. I don't like the reasons why she's been ignored any more than anyone else would, but it's really important to realise the difference between Florence Nightingale, who had a very long-term impact, admittedly partially based upon her privilege as a wealthy white woman, and Mrs. Seacole, who was known very well at the time, but soon forgotten until fairly recently. So let's take a moment to consider her contributions. Mary Seacole was a woman from Jamaica. She was mixed race. Her father was a Scottish army officer and her mother was from Jamaica, a freed slave. She used her own money to set up something called the British Hotel in Balaclava. So she was actually on the Crimean Peninsula where the fighting was happening, unlike Florence Nightingale, who was about 700 kilometres away in Skitari. This was a nursing station, but the British Hotel was also a place where men could go to relax and to enjoy a few home comforts. Seacole had to face horrendous racism and sexism, but managed to make a difference all the same. So we're going to have a look at two sources about Mrs Seacole, and we're going to consider which one we trust more and why. 
Secondly, we're going to consider what do the sources actually tell us about Mary Seacole's work. Look at source A first of all. This is a letter written by Florence Nightingale to her brother-in-law in 1870, recalling her initial in, uh, reactions to Mrs Seacole. Seacole kept, I will not call it a bad house, which is a euphemism for a brothel where prostitutes work, but something not very unlike it in the Crimean War. She was very kind to the men, and what is more, to the officers, and did some good, and made many drunk. Hmm, not entirely positive. How about this then? This is part of a poem published in the popular magazine Punch in 1856, when Seacole was in financial difficulty. It's a, it is about Mary Seacole. In the whole, in this case, means in debt. She owed money. And let's not forget that she'd have to use her own money to set up the British Hotel and to do all of her travel as well. So poor old Mrs Seacole was going to have to rely on the charity of others in order to get through uh, the financial implications of the amazing things that she did. Just before we move on, I'll mention that she wrote a book of her own to help raise this money. It was called The Adventures of Mrs Seacole in Many Lands. And it's a wonderful read to this day. The sick and sorry can tell the story of her nursing and dosing deeds. Regimental MD never worked as hard as she in helping sick men's needs. And now the good soul is in the hole, what redcoat in the land, but to see her upon her legs again, will not lend a willing hand. If you'd like to have a go at these tasks, press pause now. Well, which source do we trust more? It might be easy to think of Florence Nightingale's as a more trustworthy source. After all, it's not a poem, it hasn't got a humorous tone, uh, uh, tone, and it's written by somebody who had experience of the Crimean War. But let us not forget that it's written several years later. Why is Nightingale writing to her brother-in-law at this time? Is it because Mrs Seacole is becoming more prominent? Could there be a bit of a note of jealousy or professional rivalry keeping in here? And, dare I say, a bit of racism too? Even a, a wonderful and exceptional person like Florence Nightingale is, is unlikely to be completely infallible. On the other hand, let's consider what Source B tells us. The fact that this was published in such a, a, a popular and famous magazine shows us how famous Mrs Seacole was. And the fact that it refers to redcoats or British soldiers um, being so grateful for her work shows that her work must have made an impact in the short term and it must have been appreciated by people at the time. And indeed, her help was forthcoming and Mrs Seacole did live out the rest of her life in reasonable comfort. So, the, un the kind of uncomfortable truth here is that Mary Seacole did not make anything like as long-term a difference to the nursing profession as Florence Nightingale. The reasons for that could be related to privilege and the racism at the time and the amount of opportunity that she had. It's also related to the fact that she never really set out to do that. She set out to work th to help these soldiers more in the short term. But just if she had a less long-term impact, does that mean she so deserves to be forgotten and wiped out of the history? I, for one, think not. And that's why I've decided to finish today's online lesson with a look at Mrs Seacole, a remarkable character who deserves to be remembered. And on that note, I hope this has been useful and uh, has been enjoyable for you. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed talking about this fascinating period in, in, in history. And remember that you can like this video and subscribe and there'll be more content up soon. All the best and goodbye.